Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is Jimbo Mathis. He's going to share some stories about his friendship with the legendary underground producer, Jim Dickinson. Jim Dickinson uh, grew up in Memphis, Tennessee in the 50s, became real interested in rock and roll by seeing um, all the string bands down, the black string bands and jug bands down in Memphis uh, were all around then. And rock and roll was happening. Bo Diddley was coming through playing the sock hop. So he really just took to music at an early age. Um, uh, he went to Baylor in the 60s, got dosed with LSD in an experimental program, and dropped out of college immediately, moved back to Memphis, and started a rock and roll band. And uh, he was sort of an underground character in Memphis. He grew up around Ardent Studios and grew up in the studio scene, too. Also hanging out with people like Dan Penn, a lot of people that went on to be great producers, studio musicians. He was a great uh, visual artist as well. And then uh, fell in with um, with uh, Ahmed Erdogan and those guys um, that were recording in Muscle Shoals. I think his first meeting with Ahmed was when he brought the weed to the Stones session, uh, when Stones cut brown sugar and all that in, in Muscle Shoals. Jim bought, brought the weed and uh, and and I met knew him. I guess already knew him. Knew he was cool, uh, and they could hang with the Stones. So he and Mary went over there. Mary Lindsay, his his wife, his widow, and uh, was just hanging out, uh, rolling joints, and just grooving, you know, with the Stones. And then they're getting ready to play um, Wild Horses, and Stu, their piano player, who was their gear guy too. I guess um, couldn't play Wild Horses. He couldn't do those changes, you know, some weird changes, you know, I guess to him, he couldn't do them. And he said, I can't do it, mate, you know. And, and Jim eases back there in the back of fame. There's an old rickety out of tune upright, and he's softly figuring it out. And then here comes Keith or one of them, I think maybe it was even the drummer. Uh, Charlie Watts heard him. And said, hey, you know, get in here, you know, and, and we like that piano too. drag that in here, you know. So Jim, you know, be the guy that brings the weed. And next thing you're on the Rolling Stones, uh, Wild Horses. So that put a big boost in his career. Um, Amit hired him to be in the studio band in Miami. Um, it was, was it Criteria? The name escapes me now. It was a big Atlantic studio band, did a lot of Southern rock and soul and gospel, uh, soul music, rock and roll. Uh, so Jim cut his teeth in like top of the line Southern studio bands. So his career was more in the studios really uh, than a solo performer or a band leader. Um, he was, studio was like a mystical, wonderful place for him. He just loved everything about the psychology of it, the sound of it, the religion of it. Uh, um, and so he turned into this very, uh, very thoughtful, philosophical person that was known as an underground producer, you know, and so did, worked with Alex Chilton and some very exper experimental stuff. He stayed busy in the 80s and 90s doing uh, people send him off the wall stuff uh, uh, like the replacements. And um, then come along, uh, he, he stayed busy in Memphis. He opened up his own, he moved from Coldwater, and he opened up his own studio on some land he bought outside of Coldwater, which is still there today. That's Zebra Ranch. So that's like the shrine, his legacy is contained in, in on that land and in that building. Um, and, you know, in the 90s, Dylan hired him to do uh, Time Out of Mind, so he had big projects in the background that with Keltner and Dan Lenoir produced that. Jim was the, I think, the Whirly player in that. He was known mostly as a, as a brilliant pianist and, and just producer. You tell people what not to play or you let them figure it out for themselves, whatever their personality is. It's a matter of taking things away in the studio. And uh, so he was a master of blues piano, soul piano, rock and roll. He could play jazz. Uh, it was all self-taught, um, really, by black pianists, you know, from Memphis, barrel house pianists. 
Um, so that's a brief history of Jim Dickinson, I'd say. He passed away in about 10 years ago or so. Okay, here's a few Jim Dickinson quotes. Um, fun sticks to tape. So does, so does misery. I added the misery part. You can hear the misery. You can hear the fun. Don't think about the zebra. That was one of his little puzzles. Uh, the zebra was the lines between white and black music, how the zebra stripes intersect. And so deep down in the, in the zebra, that's where the, the music all came and separated. But I guess don't think about it as some sort of little mind riddle. That's a mystery and an, uh, wrapped in an enigma. He had different techniques in the studio, like uh, certain bands he would make go down to like New Orleans in the summertime and like rehearse with no air conditioning on. Like that was one of his big things, like kind of torture them and break them down. Uh, let me think about a few other ones. Oh, stockpile drugs. <laughs> I asked him one time for life advice, and that's what he told me. It makes sense, too. All types of drugs. Oh, get less accurate tuners, he told me one time. And he would also say tuning is a decadent Western concept. There's a bunch of them, Luther and I. Between If Luther and I get going on it, we can really roll out a lot. But he absorbed all this, you know, folklore and and um, culture that he brought to producing. So it was really more than that. Uh, it wasn't so much a technical thing as almost a mystical thing to him, I would say. And just a whole world into itself for him, you know. And he had so many little stories from everybody out there. There was always apropos to whatever was going on in the studio at that moment, but maybe he didn't want to say it directly, or it was a better way he could say it by telling this story that didn't seem quite related. And then sometimes years later, I would get it. <laughs> and sometimes right there, you'd get and go, oh, now I understand. I need to turn the amp down. <laughs> Or I need to cut out that middle bridge that's not working out or something, you know. Or Was he quick to give anecdotes about Yes, very quick. So everything from doctors, John, everyone, John Prine, you name it, Sun Ra, he'd been around. All the Jimmy Reed, he knew the Jimmy Reed tricks, you know, the mystical Jimmy Reed tricks. Alan Toussaint, I mean, Aretha Franklin, Keith Richards, I mean, just... On and on. Well, because Dylan went out to Zebra Ranch in Coldwater a couple of times just to hang out when he was in Memphis. He'd drive down or have someone drive him down and just sit and visit with Jim. When you went to Jim's house, if it wasn't cold, you sat out in the yard and just leaned on the cars. You know, that's the, that was the living room. Dylan's out there, you know, leaning on the car with Jim. They're smoking a joint, of course. And Dylan's like, you know, Jimmy, I like this place. A man can do some thinking. <laughs> a man can really do some thinking. That was a good one. And Jim, you know, it was cool because the trailers where they lived were right on the property with the Zebra Ranch barn studio. And at 5 o'clock, the session was over because Mid-South Wrestling was coming. Well, about 4.55 because it took him about five minutes to get up to the trailer. Session was over. Mid-South Wrestling was on. He was going to watch wrestling. And Mary Lindsay had dinner for him and everything. You know, he'd sit at the little in his little recliner and watch wrestling. You know, wrestling is real big in the Mid-South. It has its origins here. So to him, it's going back to the old Sid Sputnik wrestling days of the 50s, you know, when he was a kid and, you know. Was he buddies with Sputnik now? He was, he was buddies with all the Mid-South wrestlers. He did he did outlaw sessions with all Jimmy Hart probably and Jerry Lawler I'm sure and any of the wrestlers that wanted to make records they go to Jim. <laughs> he told me another thing too. He said, you know, Jimbo. He said, the music business is like a pipeline that runs in the sky and it's full of money. <laughs> it's flowing 24 hours a day, full of money. He said. You know, you can feed the pipeline, you can, can you can work on the pipeline, or but every pipeline's got little drips. He said, you can just go underneath the drips and put enough buckets, you know, 
<laughs> and you can live, you know, you can do you do it your way, you know. Nobody's telling you what to do. Everything else is too much pressure and stress and it's bullshit anyway. Said so you just do your thing and just put out enough buckets. So that's pretty much the, the advice I've lived since the, since they told me that. That one hit me immediately. Mm -hmm. That's my entire life. <laughs> That's all it is, man. It's just simple, just simple flow, input and output. And my uncle was kind of the black sheep of the family over in Clarksdale, so he was really into underground music and collecting albums. And and uh, so he turned me. He had been telling me about Jim and I, even giving me a copy of Dixie Fried um, when I was probably in my mid twenties or so. And so I'd been hearing him on the radar. Mid '90s and early '90s, I started hearing about him, and then with my group Squirrel Nut Zippers, we were coming through uh, on tour in Memphis on or about '94, I'd say, and uh, this group opened up for, for us. We were playing at a punk rock club called Barristers. This local group opened up for us, and it was Gut Bucket, which is. Luther Dickinson, Cody Dickinson, and Paul Taylor had a string band, Memphis Jug Band. This was before uh, the North Mississippi All Stars were formed, and my uncle was at the show in Memphis. He said, "And uh, he said that's Jim Dickinson sitting over there. Those are his sons playing right now, and they were really good." I uh, was washboard and Luther on that resonator, and Paul on the tub, um, a tub bass, and Jim was there uh, uh, watching the show. And it's like, cool, cool, cool. And I just loved the Gut Bucket band. And Zippers went up there and kicked butt. You know, Jim sat around for the whole show and just he really loved it. And we met real quick, you know, in the wings there. Well, I got Luther and Cody's uh, address. This was kind of pre-cell phone. And I started communicating with Luther, like, man, love you. I got all this blues music I'm doing, too. You guys would be perfect to, like, I want to play with you guys, you know. Because I got a lot of blues stuff going on and jug band stuff. I don't do it with the zippers, but you guys are what I've been looking for, you know. And we started communicating. And uh, so finally, they um, uh, I was passing through uh, Hernando, where they lived at the time. And uh, they said, come stay, with, uh, come stay with us. We'll jam and stuff. And we've got a little recording rig in the basement. We'll do some recording. Jim wants you to, to come by the house. And uh, so I get in the middle of the night, and we're down in the basement, me, Luther, Cody, jamming, you know, Jim and Mary, and Jim's mother, who was in her 90s, we were all asleep upstairs, you know. They didn't care, you know. It was a rock and roll household. I think Mary even brought a little plate of cookies down at like 3 a.m. Now, you boys are doing real good, you know. Maybe turn it off pretty soon, you know. Yes, ma'am, you know. So the next morning, I'm up. I go upstairs, and... I see Jim's mother, this little old tiny woman, walking through the house. Uh, said good morning to her. Right here comes Jim. Uh, we both kind of grinned at, at each other. So he had the exact same gold tooth I have, that that uh, ceramic uh, crown. And we just kind of looked at each other and, then we, and grinned, and then we just started laughing. And he's like, man, I love your um, songs for Rosetta record. You know, and then we just, that, that record had just come out. So by the time I met him, I guess we're looking at about 97 is when I finally met him. And we developed a relationship after that. It started coming through Zebra Ranch Studio two or three times a year, recording, doing gigs with Jim's band, doing gigs with the All-Stars. The All-Stars toured with the Zippers. I took Luther and Cody on their first tour with the Knockdown Society for my Songs for Rosetta tour and just basically kind of took them under my wing. They were still in high school. Um, and that relationship has continued on to this day. Well, here about two months ago, I get a phone call from Luther Dickinson, who's Jim's son. Now, they carry on his legacy quite honorably with their band and their music that they do. Um, I'd advise you to look them up if you don't know about the North Mississippi All-Stars. Luther Dickinson's probably, the, to me, the, he's the greatest slide player alive, and that's just to my taste. Um, his brother Cody, drumming musical genius. Um, 
been friends with him forever. Luther calls me out of the blue. He's just talking, shucking and jiving. And he's like, you know, um, I had to take Mary Lindsay. Uh, she's her, her, her health is, has gotten where she can't live by herself anymore. So she was still living on the property at the zebra ranch studio. She can't live by herself anymore. So Luther took her up to an assisted living place in Nashville. There's nobody at zebra ranch right now. So he said, man, can I just give you the keys and like, you can just, you know, start working up there and doing whatever you want to do. <laughs> he's, he's like, you know, Cody's in Arkansas. He can't do it. I'm up in N Nashville. You're next in line, you know, to get the keys. And I, you know, that's just kind of one of those moments when you just feel like a rush of like d destiny and fate and everything, you know, just crashing down like a wave, you know, it's like, Wow. So you're trying to get me the keys to Zebra Ranch. And it's like, yeah, you know, we need life in there and we need to keep it going. And you got your ear to the ground and you, you know, your family and you're down there. And so, of course, I accepted. And um, so now basically uh, I've updated all the gear up there with the state of the art, leaving the analog stuff that we want, mixing with the most modern Pro Tools uh, computer rig we can get, which is called Luna, and uh, top-of-the-line crossovers and all that stuff, and keep the legacy alive um, with producing records at, at Zebra Ranch. Um, got an engineer, and we're open for business. Um, so I'm looking very forward to the next, I guess, the rest of my life until they have to sell it uh, to running and uh, producing in Zebra Ranch. Uh, Jim's beautiful Baldwin Baby Grand, Cherry Red Baldwin Baby Grand is there. All their amps from when they started, all the drums. I got the stuff that was used on classic records and the, the RCA ribbons, that mics that he had, the Coles mic that he had. We're going to supplement that. It's just... Uh, it's just really an honor to be, um, you know, entrusted with that shrine uh, to recording and to Southern communion through music recording, you know, keep it open for Luther and his people because um, he still works there. And he's, you know, he had Luther had it very maintained, like he'd gone through and really, you know, organized a lot. It was in really good shape. I didn't know kind of what to expect. Um, but it's in great shape. It's beautiful, and uh, and it's funky, and it's full of hoodoo, and it's it's ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> There's weird shit buried in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> Trust and believe. <laughs> um, so that's my big news, you know, for those of you. Who, I mean, if you don't know, I'd say just look into Jim, look into what I've done. I think you'll see it's a perfect uh, combination there. So I'm just so happy, you know. I'm so blessed. Mm -hmm. And I thank Luther every day, you know. I said, man, we're really lucky to have each other to keep this going, you know. So it's almost like become brothers through the, the music, you know. And family, you know, that's what it boils down to. That's, that's the family that, that I claim. <laughs> There's a lot of them I don't claim. <laughs> you know, I'll cut this out. No, you can leave it in there. I don't give a <laughs> shit. <laughs>